If you wish to put it in the agenda, the, the panel is going to take most of this agenda. But, uh, anything? Everybody okay with the agenda this year? Okay, good. So now I'm going to introduce our panel. Uh, this is to do to deal with waste management. Tonight we have, I'll start from this end and work down there. Scott Gregg, he's a city councilor here in Owens Town and chair of the operations committee. Tori, Harry. Maybe that. Maybe that. Maybe Maybe And she is the director of infrastructure for services for the township of Meaford. And Barry Randall, you know Barry, he's from GB Susnet and he's head of the Waste, uh, Zero Waste Committee at Summerford. And then we have Jim Ellis from Southgate Township, who is the Public Works Manager, and Southgate is doing a lot of good things in their township, I think. And Laura Wood from the Owens Town Waste Watchers, most of you probably know Laura already. So yeah. let's give them a nice welcome. <laughs> so basically, we're going to give them each up to five minutes to give us you know, a little talk about what, what's happening and what they're doing. And then they'll be, and we'll open up for questions and answers after that. So um, I guess we can just start at this end of the table and work down if everybody's okay with that. All right. Okay. okay. Can everybody hear okay? We do have microphones, but it sounds like I'm certainly here myself. <laughs> Is everybody good? I think so. I'll be good and loud. I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, take over, Scott. Uh, well, I'm uh, very privileged to be here, to, to be able to speak tonight, and thanks for coming out. Uh, the environment is something, uh, well, we're actually just coming off of a day of capital budget, so we've been speaking to some of the items uh, which are relevant to the discussion tonight. I, I took a look at it and can we become a zero waste society in terms of just the theme? Boy, it is a challenge. I love challenges, uh, but it is a complete paradigm shift that people have to make. And it goes as far as when they start their day People have to get away from the mindset of just, they drive their kids to school. And the rest of the day, they might think about recycling a little bit. But we need to get people thinking about changing their habits 24-7. So it's, it's the little things that even people aren't doing now that, that will, you know, they'll bear fruit over time. And it's just changing the mindset and the mentality. The... Um, after, this afternoon at, um, at budget, uh, we reviewed some of the initiatives the city's done. We um, invested again next year for fifty thousand dollars in an energy uh, savings program in the waste management plan of two thousand. I guess we're about twelve years into it now. Um, we had hoped to achieve two percent reduction. Uh, just you know over a few years and looking back just over 16 to 18 we have been able to lessen our consumption of electrical um, usage from 1.427 million kilowatt hours down to 1.309 uh, that's an eight and a quarter reduction over two years so there is initiatives that we're doing that are bearing fruit we've uh, committed ourselves to revisiting and, and, and redeveloping a new strategic plan this year, or next year I guess. The environment pillar in our previous strategic plan was, I will say, very, um, uh, very small. Uh, we can do much more in terms of building upon that, and I think the climate is out there right now, and the expectation is that we'll do so. Uh, so I look forward to that, uh, and that's coming up next year where we can incorporate more things such as our long-term waste management plan into this new strategic plan. Um, I, I guess we've, uh, in terms of diversion rates, we have been a leader across the province uh, amongst municipalities for several years, or in, in the top, and we're facing the challenge a lot of municipalities are facing now is, is topping out. And now we're waiting for Stewardship Ontario to uh, implement a new, uh, new recycling collection program. It's, it's hard for me to actually wrap my head around this producer responsibility. It's a great thing, but I'm trying to, re to think about how we're going to apply 
the onus to the people in California that are putting the spinach or the salad into the plastic container and then it's being shipped to our grocery store. So it's such an expansive initiative. I'm still struggling yet to get my head wrapped around how we're going to, to build this framework in. Yes? Scott, what do you mean by chopping out? Oh, well, we, a lot of municipalities have reached a certain point in the recycling and diversion percentages, and we haven't been able to get to that 70% or that 75%. We'd like to, but we just haven't been able to get there. We're looking at uh, source, or sourced organics. Uh, we're currently speaking to our municipal neighbours who have a biodigester who, that can accept some of these goods. There is drawbacks that we're aware of to that, so we need to get over some of the hurdles, such as the baggers and, and obstacles such as that, that come into play. Uh, but that's um, that's a big a big initiative that, that could, could start to bear fruit again in terms of moving that bar a little bit more. So that's something that uh, we're looking at at this time. Um, but uh, yeah, I've, I've got our, our goals from the waste management plan and I look forward to hearing more tonight and um, this is something that we're able to revisit again uh, at operations or at council next year and, and build upon what have we accomplished here and what do we need to do next. So. Perfect. Um, so I'm Tori Perry Mabida. I'm with the municipality of Meaford. So I'm just going to give an overview of what we are doing in Meaford, and hopefully it will provide a different perspective than maybe what's going on in Owen Sound right now. Um, so Meaford right now is in a five-year contract with Miller Waste, um, and included in that contract, uh, Meaford Waste Management includes collection of garbage, recycling, and organics at people's houses, as well as additional drop-off of household hazard waste, leaf and yard waste, elect electronic uh, depots, uh, battery drop-off, pens and marker recycling, Christmas tree drop-off, and access to a transfer station. So some of these diversion programs are through partnerships with local municipalities and organizations. Uh, for example, our household hazardous waste um, we partner with Owen Sound on that, and our e-waste program um, is run through Meaford Fire Department. So our um, home pickup includes garbage pickup bi-weekly, and residents are required to purchase bag tags for all garbage put to the curb, which currently cost $3 a bag, to a maximum of three bags. Um, and we are working on transitioning to a full cost recovery over a five-year period, which started in 2017 with uh, incremental increases in bag tag costs. And as of right now, um, that magic number of covering costs seems to be about $5 a tag. Um, our recycling and organics are collected weekly at no cost to the resident. Um, and then also uh, something that we have in Meaford to assist with our waste management is in 2017, uh, Meaford launched uh, Meaford Waste app. The app provides all information about um, waste management in the municipality. The app includes scheduling of pickups as well as when the um, different locations are open for drop off. There's a search uh, location in the app where you can determine how to collect, correctly dispose of items. Um, and then there's also support and contact information as well as locations where you can purchase bag tags from vendors. And in 2018, there was over 28,000 searches on how to correctly dispose of specific items. Um, so that definitely helps with diversion. Um, to get a bit more into our diversion rates. So diversion rates are normally provided by Resource Productivity and Recovery Authority. Um, and so you provide them with all of your information about um, where your garbage or recycling or um, organics are going. 
um, in a lengthy report, and then they provide you back with that diversion rate. Um, in 2014, I think, Meaford was within the top three um, of diversion rate. However, since then, um, in 2017, they've come up with a short form so that we don't have to provide as much information um, for smaller municipalities because it was quite uh, time consuming for our staff. Um, and so now we only provide them with blue box information so we don't actually get that diversion rate from the authority but we have been completing our own in-house calculations um, based on annual tonnage that we receive from Miller Waste. And so um, some of our stats over the past couple years, uh, in 2016 and 2018, we diverted 66% um, of our waste, and in 2017, we diverted 67%. And our goal as a municipality is to reach that 70% diversion rate. Thank you, Tori. Uh, thanks, David. And I uh, wasn't sure of the format tonight. I, I did appreciate the panel, but I did ask also have a PowerPoint that I could show, which I could either do now or I could pass the, the handle, so to speak, and I could then just get it set up and do it yeah, after sure. the next people. Okay. Is you okay with doing a bit of a PowerPoint? Sure. Yeah. Okay, well why, well, why don't you go and I'll just... Go down there and set up the power plant. Okay, thanks. Good evening, good people. Um, the township of Southgate consists of an amalgamation uh, back in 2000 of Proton and Egremont Township and our metropolis, Dundalk. Um, so we ran into a bit of trouble with uh, the way our uh, systems were all different uh, at the beginning of time. So in 2003, um, we invested $3.2 million into a three-cart system with uh, the one-armed bandit truck doing the, the pickups on the carts. So bi-weekly we collect recycling and waste, and then every week we collect organics, which can be food and or uh, yard and leaf uh, materials. Um, we, in turn of uh, what we were facing for landfill challenges at that time, which was very limited, we were down to about 25%, or sorry, 25 years. And uh, our current study uh, from our uh, engineer last year reveals that since then and what we've done, our capacity now remaining at the landfill is 80 years. Mm. Um, with an opportunity to gain another 25 years of reclaiming the old pile because it was uh, not set at the right elevation. So if we move that pile and sort it out, uh, some of the steel or other materials, not really fine tooth comb it, but take out some of the bigger stuff, the tires or whatever that might be in there, um, seven meters down will give us another 25 years of landfill capacity. That's not where zero waste is going um, when you think of we're, we're creating landfill space, but in Ontario, that's a very valuable uh, piece of real estate. Um, some of the uh, stats that we have um, that uh, I've seen we're asked to provide some numbers here. So in 2018, um, we recycled about 633 tones um, in compost. It was uh, 684 tones, and food waste, which we received from a couple other neighboring municipalities because our environmental compliance approval allows us to uh, receive uh, compost or organics or um, municipal hazard and special waste from uh, the neighboring uh, counties around us, and that's uh, Simcoe, Dufferin, Bruce, uh, Region of Waterloo, Wellington, um, and there's a few others there. So our ECA is open that we are, we could be open for business, uh, for organics in the future, if, if that's what uh, someone wished to approach us with. Um, and we, uh, electronics were about 26 tone last year, tires 21 tones. Some of those are in the new programs of being phased out and have been phased out. We are still in collection of those things. We don't receive any funding, but it's, uh, it's not a cost for us. 
Uh, we don't really touch them. We're just receiving them, other than electronics, putting them in a in a bin, and uh, and so we still want to be involved with these programs at this point in time um, to make sure, because in the past we were picking them up on the side of the road. So we don't want that uh, steel about uh, 107 tons oil. A hundred, this is like used motor oil and that type of stuff. A uh, hundred and thirty thousand, or sorry, thirteen thousand liters last year. Oil containers, that's your uh, plastics that the oils come in. Uh, two tone of those. Uh, car batteries, 1.4 tone. In 2011, we were the first ones in Ontario to have a mobile hazardous waste unit, which is called an orange drop. <coughs> And we have that for three months at our Dundalk transfer station. We then have our uh, hazardous waste provider come. He empty, they empty it out and take it away for disposal. We have a roll-off truck. We take it over to our Egremont site, empty, and then we start the process over again on that side of the township. Generally, that bin is fairly full. Um, it's designed to be explosion-proof. It has leaked. Um, capabilities for, for uh, capturing if something ruptures. We've shared this design throughout the province. Other municipalities and counties have uh, incorporated and brought that into uh, their fleet and systems. Um, again, we, we were part of back in the day of coming, going sound and, uh, you know, it, it's a 45 minute or, or longer drive for residents. It's just not happening. So this was a good thing um, that we saw and, uh, and, uh, and we were able to make it happen with Stewardship Ontario right as the breaking ground for, for new, new mobile service. Last year we, uh, we diverted 24 tons of uh, drywall materials and 27 tons of shingles. Um, our organics collection looks like we collect about 32% at the curbside in the carts and at the transfer stations we're about 27%. Um, our compost is windrowed at our Egremont facility. We uh, flip those piles about uh, once weekly. We sometimes have to water them. We give that away as a finished product after it's been tested. We usually only screen it once a year, and that's free to residents uh, to come and pick up and take away and uh, dig in and get growing with it. So um, that composting processing part take costs us about $18,000 a year to uh, do that piece of the puzzle. In all operations, I don't have the breakdown costs. I was rushed with uh, some other meetings the last few days and, and didn't quite, I brought some wrong paperwork but I grabbed it off the desk. But uh, our operations for uh, waste diversion resources management operationally year per year is just under 800,000 for, for that service. Um, we did just launch a new sort Southgate tool, as uh, Tori uh, alluded to. Um, you can punch it in and find out where that material goes or whatever. Um, it's been a very helpful because um, just recently, um, within the last few months, our uh, processor, our material uh, facility that we take recycling to is Mount Forest uh, Waste Management. They uh, said there was a high uh, contamination rate at that point in time, a lot of black bags. So um, we put our drivers to the task, which they already have a tagging system for, and told them start tagging whatever you see. The cameras see it when it's going in, but sometimes it's too late, and sometimes you don't see it till it's tipped off. But we put an aggressive program out there with, uh, this is not a garbage cart, that it's a, a, your blue cart your blue box and um, we have come back we've pre-sorted at uh, our landfill not just taking out some of the bulky stuff that we found gas cans it's wish recycling people think that anything's plastic oh it's recyclable it's not um, and then we get penalized you get penalized and uh, anyhow a pre-sort of that stuff lawn chair again people think it's metal that it belongs there we have those facilities, but it's at the transfer station to be sorted out properly. And uh, 
you know, it's odd, but we were found, we had to eliminate glass bags because you can't see if it's garbage or recycling. Um, we got that message out through a flyer to every residence and uh, getting staff reports through and some media notice through the newspapers down there and uh, the tagging system. And, uh, you know, we're even seeing bags of uh, goose parts and, and stuff. So I don't, I don't know why people would think that that would belong in their blue cart. But, um, again, it comes down to some education and, and laziness. But those are the type of scenarios that are ruining um, the programs, too. And just to touch on where we're going um, with this uh, phasing out and going and transitioning, um, the hazardous waste program is the next one here, and then Blue Box. In some ways, it's a step going backwards because we need a province-wide Blue Box standard. Everybody puts the same thing in because I can guarantee you that we're all doing different things. Some people can take styrofoam, some people can't. We need standardized programs across the province to make it work. Some things are going to get left out. I fully agree it's... Uh, extended producer fully responsible for those programs and same thing municipalities have built a lot of good systems and done a lot of good things to keep diversion where it's going and yeah it's going down as opposed to going up basically at this point in time and uh, we we're going to find if we don't get it right with these transition programs, we're going to be finding the stuff on the side of the road again. We're going to be finding it back in the landfill, and that's certainly not good for the environment. Mm -hmm. wow. Sorry, you guys have that <laughs> Do you want to go, Barry? Or well, let me just see what. Not to the garage too much. Okay, I'm, I'm good to go. Okay, um, so Dave and I were talking about the you know, planning this event, and uh, I think I just kind of jumped in and said, well, what about the, the local event that we're doing that for the last few years, and actually for many, many years, has uh, had a focus on uh, recycling and reducing waste and that sort of thing. So. Um, I thought it would be good to share some of the um, protocols that Summerfolk, that one of the, I'm going to say the most important, one of the most important events, you know, it sounds certainly not the biggest, you know, the Sentence Spectacular, the huge event. All these events generate a lot of waste and uh, it's like the intense residential use or commercial use for, because there always, there's always beer marks and there's always all kinds of uh, waste that's generated at these events. So, what we did uh, in the leading up to the 2018 uh, summer folk, we put together a green team, and a good number of people came forward. And uh, we basically uh, we worked with an organization called Bush Systems out of Barrie, and they were very supportive. Those green <laughs> bins that you see there, the vertical green bins, uh, they were supplied by Bush Systems, and in the first year. Um, those we collected compost in, in those bins, and what Bush has, is developing is a is a uh, monitoring system, a measuring system to help specifically through events, but they also supply these similar kind of bins to large organizations and municipalities. I think, and they have to develop a, a measurement protocol, a database system, and a reporting system that um, helps you measure from one event to the next, or from one year to the next, how much of each of these streams um, are being generated at the site, so you can see how much progress you're making. So, actually, interesting, that vertical sign there is a sign that was probably generated about 12 or 13 years ago, when that was also, back in the day, a number of local people were involved in doing the same thing, and those were the leftover signs that hadn't been used for a few years. So, like anything, the politics of an organization changes and people come and go and, and uh, programs start and then they kind of fizzle out and then they start again, but we're currently dedicated to keeping this going. So uh, there's a, a number of issues that pop up. One is that our green team starts on Friday at 5 and Laura and her gang were part of it this year. Uh, they weren't part of it, I don't think, the year before, but um, 
and what you've got, uh, we start at 5 o'clock or so on the Friday, but you've got two weeks worth of really intense work that happens before the festival starts. That wasn't included in our data measuring and that sort of thing. But this is just an example of pre-festival material. The stuff on the left, I was told very clearly that is being recycled and that sort of thing. But in terms of the organization of the bins and separating the source and signage and that sort of stuff, it didn't really exist before the event. Uh, this is, so we had a sorting station where everything that was generated during the festival was brought to this sorting station and was as, as best as we could separated into various streams and was weighed and um, um, recorded uh, and then deposited in the appropriate uh, Miller Waste bins that were that were part of the festival because the city, that's the city's contractor for for waste collection. So Miller was very supportive. Um, so they would take they took everything except the compost stream, and the composting was taken by a local farmer. But what it meant was the local farmer only wanted food waste. So the only food waste we could collect that year, the only compost in, was food waste. Everything else. If it was a contaminated recyclable material that would go in the garbage or... And, and this is the same problem that, that Jim and I mentioned in terms of the range of materials that are out there. Mm -hmm. Even though um, this year we didn't restrict any the use of any materials, you do get a wide, wide range. Uh, if you've not told and, and instructed the vendors to bring only certain things, you just get a wide range of things. Some are recyclable, some are not and uh, it gets very complicated. Even things like some of the supply bins for uh, some of the oils and that sort of thing uh, are difficult to move along. But this is the, the strategy that we have. We've got a variety of sites, I think about 17 different pickup stations around the site, and um, there's a separate team that's been going for many years that drives around in, in a pickup truck and picks up all the material from the very site and does from the site and then delivers it to the green team tent, which is where our weighing stations were. And each of the bags, um, and this is the bush system system, uh, was labeled in terms of uh, the time it was picked up and the, the stream that it was. It was either garbage or 100% recycling, or if it was a mixed bag, it was identified, or if that was a full bag. If it was half full, it was a 50% bag. So that was just kind of in the, the development process of, um, through the 2018 event. And then at the end of it, we decided we would, we would carry on and put together a team for the next year. And I don't think, I think I've used my time, so I won't go through a series of photos uh, that happened in the second year. The significant things in the second year were that uh, Miller Waste agreed to take the compost um, and anything, again, you guys, you folks would help to understand what can go in a compost stream that goes to Miller Waste because they pretty much took paper, they took contaminated, they took napkins, they took pretty much a lot of things, not just food waste, uh, compostable cups. Uh, the big thing that summer folk did this year is they banned single-use plastics. And that meant that the vendors coming in, um, theoretically, could not bring uh, anything other than <coughs> or, or encourage people to use refillable containers. And buy a mug and fill it up and go to the, you're having a beer, have a beer mug, don't use plastic cups. Not everything happened perfectly this year, but um, the hope is that, and we've got data, and that if anybody wants to get more into it, um, I can share that information with you, um, to head towards uh, next year, and with the help of you know waste watchers and, and people in the community, we'll have what we need are more people on the team because uh, in advance of the festival, there's all kinds of things going on that need help during the festival and then post festival. And just finally, uh, I've been involved with Hillside Festival in Guelph for many years. This year, I worked on the post festival green team. Basically, what we did for two days is sort garbage. <laughs> And uh, it's not, we don't call it the garbage crew, it's the green team, you know. But that's what it's coming down to, because even at a festival that's won all kinds of awards for the greening that they do, still people coming put stuff wherever they want, and it needs to be sorted at the back end.
So if you are interested in joining a really sexy green team, please talk to Laura or myself. I know Laura's going to be working on it as well, and we'll get you signed up. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Gary. Yeah, we want to see those pictures, though. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm sure. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> okay, Laura. Great, thank you very much. My name is Laura Wood, and I'm a member of the Owen Sound Waste Watchers team. I'd like to thank you so much for inviting us to participate tonight. And I'd also have a shout out to the team members who helped me prepare the presentation tonight. Um, David asked us to answer a few questions, in particular to who are we and what do we do? And listening to this, we do something a little different from uh, the rest of the team. First of all, I'm going to give you a brief history lesson of recent history. The inspiration for the Owen Sound Waste Watchers is a young Canadian woman by the name of Rochelle Byrne. And she is from Southern Ontario. She started an organization called A Greener Future. She hosts regular trash pickups um, around Lake Ontario called Love Your Lake. They have gathered over a million pieces of trash in the last couple of years. And she educates other people, other individual, individuals, about moving to a zero waste lifestyle. That, that, that kind of crazy, scary future. So inspired, 15 Owen Sound friends and neighbors gathered together to pick up trash along the East Harbor last year as what I called a social experiment. And it was a lot of fun and it was a great success. And so a group of us got together and we said that we would form a planning group, we would continue our activities under the name Owen Sound Waste Watchers. So here's how we describe ourselves. We are a group of concerned citizens committed to helping everyone make a difference by adjusting how we consume and dispose of products in daily life. A guiding philosophy of our group is that individuals can drive change towards a cleaner, less toxic, and sustainable future by making small changes, one person at a time. We also believe that we're all connected and we're best served when we support each other. So as we're doing tonight, um, we have different people from different um, uh, organizations. Fortunately, we don't have a business organization here. That would be fantastic if we did. And we also believe that when we work best, when we work collaboratively with government and business. So lastly, our group is a group of doers. You have to be a doer to be a Owen Sound Waste Watcher. So what do we do? There's our second question. What do we do? Okay, the first thing we do is we act. So in 2019, we organized six pickups, trash pickups, all around Owen Sound. And I would say probably 50% of the time, maybe not 50%, including what you're doing, and but 50% of our pickups are around the harbor. Uh, we track and report. Barry was talking about methodologies of tracking. We've taken ours from a greener future. We follow her tracking. Greg, you've seen it in action. Yeah. Um, and we used a structured data collection process. So we're very, I don't want to say we're happy to report, but we will report that we have collected 108,717 pieces of litter this year. So we act. The second thing we do is we learn and we respond. So what did we learn from the data? Well, we learned that 90% of what was collected was cigarette butts or smoking-related waste. Of, um, of the remainder, only 2%, if it was non-smoking related, only 2% was recyclable material that we picked up. So that meant over 10,000 items went to landfill. We learned that food litter is everywhere. Um, almost 3,400 items were collected, including plastic wrappers, plastic cups, lids, straws, and utensils. You take a moment to visit our table later, you'll see the whole magical chart, data chart, and it breaks down not only by the type of item, but if it's recyclable or not, and how it was disposed of. Lastly, we discovered that many thousands of pieces of glass, metal, and foam wash ashore along both sides of our, lock, our harbor. We could pick up in one area and come back a month later, 
and see thousands of pieces more. And this is consistent with what Rochelle Byrne has seen all the way around Lake Ontario and what we're hearing about around the world. If it's in the water at some point, if it's not the ocean, it will make its way to shore. And that's what we're seeing on our shore. So what's our response? Okay, so the Owen Sound made deputations to both City Council and the Operations Committee requesting that a single-use plastic ban be approved. Um, city staff gave careful consideration and they recommended that the ban be delayed until the proposed federal government ban is announced and this um, delay recommendation was approved last week. So I'd have to say that while the, that decision to delay was a, a disappointment to our group, we are happy that more local attention is being paid to the problem of single-use plastic waste. We talked about 90% of what we picked up being cigarette waste. So in response to that high percentage, we created cute butt cans. Um, while a local business gave us these cans and we made them cute, and we bravely placed them in visible spots downtown without asking any permission. The butts were gathered by our group, and we, re we recycled, we learned about a recycling program called TerraCycle from our contact Rochelle at A Greener Future. In June, we thought maybe we can do more, so we submitted a proposal to city staff for a pilot project for four TerraCycle receptacles to be placed along the new river front precinct area. We saw this new development that was happening, and we knew it was going to happen. It was going to be littered with cigarette butts as more people were coming into it. And we actually purchased and donated one. We took it to City Hall and we said, look at this. We were delighted with City Hall's response to that. Um, not only did they take our one receptacle, they bought more than four, they bought many more, um, installed them downtown, um, asked us to scout out locations, we drove around town, we gave them some ideas, they used our ideas and in some cases came up with better ideas of where they could go. And we continue to work with the city staff to monitor the collection findings and recycle the butts, rather than simply toss them into landfill. Cigarette butts will make their way to water, whether it's tossed into landfill eventually, whether it's in a sewer grate, which people do, they think that's the best, better way to, than putting them in a garbage can where they might light something on fire, or as we've seen along our harbor, right into the water. Uh, another response, this summer we created a Adopt-A-Butt-Can project and this is for people or, or individuals in neighborhoods. If they would like to, to adopt a butt can and use it, um, we also have a sample of what our recycling kit is there and they contact us, we gather them, we process them and ship them off to TerraCycle. So we have lots of plans um, for next year, you'll have to stay tuned. So secondly, we learn and respond. So the last thing we do is we educate, consult, and collaborate, but simply say we share. We share information, we share ideas. So when we share, we emphasize the power of the individual. Consumers drive and business follows. Um, many years I worked in advertising and my clients would always ask, who's the customer and what do they want? And while we would like to think that our government will lead us. The reality is that consumer demand and business response is actually going to drive this change. So we also share information, tips, ideas, and news within our community. We host things called Talking Trash Socials. We have had two this year. We have one more scheduled for tomorrow at the Bayfield Community Center and nonprofit um, community. We also have a Facebook page that, as I was writing this presentation, went from 240, 250, 270, and I think we just hit 280 people today, and that's climbing. And I, it's just speaking to, there's no effort that we're making on our part. We're not boosting that site at all. People are hearing about it, and they're wanting to know what they can do. And so, as part of the sharing, we are sharing simple ideas of what individuals can do that can drive big change in the amount of garbage that you're putting out and even the amount of recycling that you're putting out. Once again, if you visit our table, there's information about what individuals can do. 
And finally, Barry talked about this, we continue to provide Going Green support to local groups. Uh, most recently, we consulted and supported the Words Aloud Festival, um, met with their new executive director and gave them some ideas, and then a bunch of Owen Sound Waste Watchers rolled up their sleeves, and after we recommended that they don't use plastic cups and uh, paper plates, actually we're out washing dishes for them in Durham and in um, Owen Sound. We assisted summer folk, as Barry said, we won't talk too much about that, but uh, and the Salmon Spectacular, we provided these cute little butt cans, and our volunteers collected and recycled about 17,000 cigarette butts with those two festivals. I must say the Salmon spectac Spectacular was an eye-opener, mm -hmm. and the people there were so appreciative of providing, us providing butt cans, but a lot of them brought their own butt cans, which was fabulous. But it wasn't just going into the garbage. They would, we would collect their butt cans uh, from their butt cans as well. Uh, last week, we met with folks in Annan to just share and discuss ideas of what individuals individuals can do. And lastly, we continue to monitor trends um, in our own ongoing association with a greener future and Rochelle Byrne, the young woman who really started it all. So, in closing, I'm just going to leave you with this thought. I'm only one person, you are only one person, but collectively we are many people, and together we can have a huge impact and drive the necessary and important changes to creating a more sustainable future. Thank you. Thank you, Laura, and thank you all your panelists. So now we're going to open the floor to questions. Yes. Um, particularly for Scott, uh, where does Owen Sound's uh, non-recyclable garbage go, and and where does the recycling go to? The non-recycling the garbage, the garbage <laughs> Miller waste. Uh, trucks, two, I think it's two truckloads a day and, and they cross the border at Port Huron, I believe. Still, it's it's under their jurisdiction. I, they have they have the contract and as far as I'm aware, that's where it goes. I don't believe it's true. I think it's, I did, well, I think it's going to um, somewhere down by Sarnia. I heard that they're, it's going to one of their private Ontario sites. Yeah. Now. Oh, okay, yeah. so they've converted, but yeah, um, they have that contract. We haven't uh, internally had a whole lot of information as to how they're disposing of it. The second question was the recycling component. Yes, like where does recycling go from other ways? It, it, I might open that up, but if someone else has better information on. I'm not sure on that. That's a private market takes over some of that. So, if it was steel content, then they're sourcing out their their best. Um, their yeah, that's best what it is. It's a it's it. a private or, private business that is selling its material to various people that are willing to buy it. And, and there's markets for recycling steel, which are currently overseen by. Um, it's the outfit that's uh, being taken over by Stewardship Ontario, and I forget the name of it off the top of my head. They're just starting the process of, of transferring those those duties to Stewardship Ontario, but it's still, it, I think that part gets down to private, private markets for that commodity, because it's a commodity, right? So it's, uh, they're deeming it to have value. And unfortunately, styrofoam was deemed to not have value, and, and we lost the avenue of recycling it. So, well, I went, yeah. Well, we, okay. we, we know that a lot of recyclables are not being recycled. It depends where it is, but it's somewhere around, I don't know, maybe around 50% gets recycled roughly around the country. I'm just wondering if it might be possible to have an audit to check where the different Recycled or recyclable materials are actually going, what streams. I think there was a problem on market side, like mm -hmm. on CBC, which was actually a rather uh, depressing story. Mm -hmm. 
Alarming, sorry. Which was very alarming. So I wonder if that might be a possibility. Because otherwise, it's the illusion uh, that we that we think we do something good, which is kind of the downside of, um, of recycling in general, because it doesn't do what it's supposed to, to do, and it makes us feel good. It's more of a feel good thing rather than a reality thing. Mm -hmm. So it's a suggestion. I like it. I think it's something. I mean, uh, goals. We've got a whole number of goals on a, something that we should have been doing for many years alongside our long-term waste management plan and we haven't revisited a lot of that and it's something we should be doing and we should be more current on that information uh, so I'm very supportive of, of us getting that kind of information in the near future because it's still like you know Laura says it builds on the momentum out there right now it's out there and it keeps it at the forefront people are aware and there is it's kind of it becomes more ingrained into their consciousness so I like the idea. Yeah. Um, I have two things. One, I really don't want to pick on you, Scott, and I'm really disappointed that nobody else from the city is here. But it, what Laura said about about every person being able to do, um, it's really important that the city does take some leadership and does look like they're leading. I I I was so stunned when I was at a city council meeting where they had. Um, uh, catered food come in and they literally opened little plastic packets that next door to their staff kitchen they opened little plastic packets and took out their forks and knives to eat off plastic plates and and this is at a meeting with 12 people and it was catered I called the caterer afterwards and I said I'm just curious if people ask for non-plastic dishes would you provide them and they said absolutely so you've got to walk the talk the city has to walk the talk itself. They've got to. They've got to show leadership. The fact that they won't ban plastic bottles and all of that sort of stuff it says volumes to everybody else in town about how acceptable plastic bottles and plastic waste are. That, that's one thing. The second thing is Barry asked a question on Facebook about this event, <laughs> and he asked the question, "Why don't we have um, source-separated organics in Owen Sound?" So I just want to go back to. A decade or so ago, before the last contract, um, Miller Waste contract, waste management, probably before the second last one, Sally, what's Sally's company? Sally Leverett's company. Len, uh, Laura? Laura Consulting. Uh, Consulting. Consulting came, and this is this is the way we used to do things in Owens Out. At the Bay Shore, there was a big meeting, and there were round tables, and people sat around those tables, and they did an entire couple of hours of consulting with actual real citizens who talked about what was there, what was important to them. We're talking about a decade ago, so long before this was a crisis, long before it was on every TV show, and people talked about it, and they said the number one thing they wanted was source-separated organics. Mm -hmm. And in the conclusion of the consultant's uh, report was... The city is not prepared, this is too expensive, and the city is not prepared to do this at this time. But, it said, this is the number one thing that the citizens of Bowen Sound want. So you ask why we don't have it? We don't have it because we had sort of political will, but not really political will, because we did not demand, we demanded lower taxes. We did not demand that we take this as a priority. And since then, of course, every other municipality, thank you very much. <laughs> so they thank you for thanking Meeford for taking the lead. Meeford, little wee Meeford, took the lead. They were the first in the area to have source separated organics at the curb. They took the leadership. They showed how it could be done. So really, I'm not going to buy one more time. We are very soon. How soon having our new uh, waste contract come up? We should all be at City Hall demanding that that be included in our new waste management contract. No more BS. Obviously, Miller even yeah. does it, for God's sake. Yeah. <laughs> so two, two years is the answer on that. Two and we'll be reviewing. It would be the uh, approaching this expiry of the seven-year contract. Uh, question for Jim. Jim, do you have more control over where your recyclables end up to the final destination than by hiring a private company of the No. Uh, we take it to waste management in Mount Forest. Um, they have a material recycling facility, a MRF, 
Um, they they sort it and do what they do with it. And, uh, you know, quite frankly, it could be going, some of it will be going to landfill too. Um, especially because people don't take the time to rinse it or clean it out. That contaminates it. Those things that are contaminated that way, they're going in the landfill. They're, in, they're not getting somebody to wash the jar and recycle it. It ain't happening. It has to happen at home before you put it in the box or the cart. Education. Sorry, I just want to say, that's one of the challenges I had when I moved back to Owen Sound. Grew up here, went to Toronto, worked there for 30 years, came back retired. And I put things in the recycling bin in Owen Sound, thinking, well, it'll be exactly the same as Toronto. Jim Yard's been right, it's not. It's different all over the place. But there were things that I just didn't know. And, you know, um, securitously tried to find out what about contamination. On one hand, I was told, well, the amount of water it takes to wash your jar in your kitchen sink is less efficient than if they do it at a processing station. But I don't know if that's true in Toronto. Is it different in Owen Sound? What is the answer to all this? So I go back to these amazing applications that are search and, and um, the proper place to dispose of products. Yes, we want less products and less waste, but there's always going to be something. Um, so I'm just curious about the applications, having never looked at them. Do they include things like make sure you wash your jars before you toss them in your blue bin? Or is it just they go in the blue bin? Because how much of that contamination could we literally eliminate if people simply know, gosh, you're going to have to rinse out that can of tomato soup, yeah. whatever it may be? So, no. so I, again, I come back to education and awareness and being part of some waste watchers because people are coming up and asking me, like I'm some kind of authority and I'm not. <laughs> You're wearing this shirt. Yeah, I'm wearing this shirt. I'm wearing this shirt. But it is uh, information and that sharing has been profoundly helpful. And I'm so grateful for support from Scott and everybody mm -hmm. else is lending hand in hand. I can go on and on. But part of it that I just keep coming back to as educating adults through most of my career is if people don't know, they can't make the change. And so I turned to the Own Sound um, uh, website, for example, for, for City Hall, from City Hall, and it's hard to find information. There isn't necessarily what are we doing, what's there. Um, so I come back to what are the plans around educating the community? Uh, and some fantastic job, for example, on Hub. I've got all kinds of people following that now. Because it's constantly information about, did you know this is possible? Are you doing this? Mm -hmm. So I would just look for some leadership around educating the public and what might we do on the, on the website and how we should promote that. Because everybody's into social media. Do you have a, you know, you have some push that does it take a lot of resources? Could you look to volunteers to be willing to help with something like that? Just throwing that out there. Mm -hmm. Education is key because some of us just don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. I can speak. Uh, and, and say that Cassandra Sesco, who is our new environmental yeah. supervisor, is a tremendously enthusiastic young employee who is so encouraging to listen to her uh, and, and her willingness to tackle the issues that you're just speaking to. Um, some of that, ed I mean, education is right at the top of what she's wanting to to build upon Does she in her role. Time to do it. She's got uh, a pretty heavy portfolio. She does. Uh, one of the pre her predecessor also was uh, responsible for the airport, and that's no longer uh, something that Cassandra has to be responsible for. So she's had components of the old role removed. So I think she's able to focus more on on the waste management side. Uh, she's more of a prof she's more of a professional. What her role would entail, obviously, than I am, but. I know her, her enthusiasm is to really build and enhance That's the current educational system. component. Okay, well, encouragement coming from this corner. Oh, I, I hear you because even, um, like, I, 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 I like to think I'm a really strong recycler, mm -hmm. but there's times when I might be at the base shore, for instance, and you're holding a particular item and you just see a... I can waste, I can, I, there's a garbage bag, or there's a recycling unit, and what I'm holding kind of, 
kind of matches Mike, maybe what might go in. Yeah. So that the sort it right programs where you build the consistency from home right through to public facilities. So it, it takes some of that, it lessens the thought processes of, of am I going to contaminate this? Everybody thinks I want to recycle it, so I'll just throw it in, but I'm not sure. Yeah. Well, credit to Summer Folk, because one of the things that Barry and team did on the green team is literally listed things mm -hmm. and said, this is what we mean. <laughs> so it wasn't just, you know, landfill or garbage. In fact, when we had a words aloud, we did landfill and went, last choice, last chance to really emphasize landfill is the last place you want to put anything. Um, but anyway, just throwing it out there around education. education and making more people aware. We'll make changes, but some of us are struggling to know what to do and when to do it. Well, the answer to that is now. Over here. Next. Forgot your question? Okay. And that was the next one. Just, I have to know one of the boundaries and won't sound like quite well. <laughs> and, uh, at the very beginning, when you were starting it, um, I spent a lot of time talking to the city and talking to motor waste because I'm a former Toronto guy and it's, it is a different world, it's done very differently and I didn't know how it was done here. And I have to say just to your point about the education, it's difficult. I spent a lot of time with people, everybody was very nice, very helpful, but it was really hard to get specific answers. I, I, you know, I kept listening off what about this, what about this. And what I learned is that um, motor waste is the current provider for the city of Old Town, um, is about to soon uh, stop picking up um, paper coffee cups and milk cartons uh, in, the, in their box full of suction. And the reason is because they only pick up the recycling what they have a market for. They've lost the market for styrofoam, that's why that's gone. Well. They're about to lose the market for these coffee cups. And as we found in Mullins and Wastewater, that's a huge part of what we're picking up in garbage. And I would guess that 90% of Mullins and residents do not know currently the cup from Tim Hortons is recyclable, but it is not. Most people don't know that. And it, it's just, it's really hard to get that education. So if there's tools like those apps and stuff that we can get more of that more easily, we, we need a lot more. Mm -hmm. on, the, on the styrofoam piece, sorry, I just, and if anybody wants to pick up, um, just at any point in time, pick up that column, <laughs> of styrofoam, that's an example of uh, industry saying um, there's, there's technology that we can use to make certain things recyclable. So that is densified uh, styrofoam in a densifier that's owned now by the municipality of Brockton, formal in Walkerton. It's really heavy. And they're, uh, so they're taking their styrofoam and densifying it down into that kind of um, column and they've got skids of them now that are about 650 pounds a piece and they're working with the Plastics Association to find a market and are developing markets for that material which is um, economical to ship because it's densified. Mm -hmm. So, and the film plastic piece which is another non-recyclable material, there's, there's a good amount of work. Uh, Miller Waste picks up film plastic. Uh, in Brockton, film plastic is recycled in a depot and, and bailed and taken to a, a local firm in Listowel and is made into square eco roster paving, permeable paving tiles. So that's my kind of spin on things is we can tell people not to do things, but if we give them an opportunity to do things that generate jobs and use good technology and, you know, th there's, there's some ways to do things. Yeah. Pardon? You collect film plastic in the um, Yes, no, you, yeah. yeah, you do. Yeah, you yes. do. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's shipped to a different stuff. company. I've been in talking with them. Uh, when I went to actually see the densifier when it first uh, yeah. got implemented, yeah. uh, I was out there and saw that, and uh, I've been in touch with them, um, but we're not in a program and yet. Plastic. We're not in a program and yet. Plastic. We're working towards... Uh, We've, we've had some talks with them, but... Thanks. <laughs> yeah. I, I was very intrigued by the Waste Management Act 
and I'm wondering if it was developed in-house, and if so, is that something that is scalable that could be shared with other municipalities? Because there, there are wonderful things going on, you know, in little pockets, mm -hmm. but it just seems so hard, it's so frustrating to know for an old sounder, you know, what I can put in that blue box. If there were an app, you know, it would just be so much simpler to, and again, I do find the city's website really difficult to navigate. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So I'm was not. So our communications um, person is the person who was involved with developing our app and um, updates it. Um, but I can imagine that she has information on what she did to develop it. Um, my assumption is that we are probably with a like an app provider, and we have a, a platform that we can then put the information into the app. Um, and we, for instance, if there's an additional day added to Leaf and Yard Waste, um, it will send you a notification through the app. Um, so um, if you did want to add information like you need to clean out this container before it goes into recycling, that information could all be added into that app and notifications can get sent to people's phones when those updates are made. Um, so, yeah, I can imagine this information could easily be passed on to an, another municipality to do something similar. Um, but yeah, right now it's our communications um, staff member who is responsible for it. <laughs> Some seniors do. Some seniors do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is it easy or would it be difficult for the city to demand the mill and waste to come up with a color, four page, or three page, or one page printout of examples of pictures of a milk carton that says green and pictures of this examples? And maybe like a section of what has changed since the last publication and maybe something vibrant? Is it? I think that's probably something that we would tackle in house uh, with with staff resources to I mean, do. There is a one pager. I don't think it's color. It might be color, but there is a one pager on the website that lists all the items that go in the various it's like streams. You print it out yeah, it's a PDF. You print yeah. it out. There's a, there's a sample of it on the table over there. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, I might add too. I I still find it the LDP two, HDP four. And then, but you're holding a three or a five or a six, or a and, six, yeah. and <laughs> it, it's very hard to six. No six. extend it out as, as far as some of the products almost leave you feeling it, it needs to be um, provided for you. But I do hear you on the uh, the washing um, because I'm not aware even personally as to what degree it has to be washed before it. Reaches a contamination well, stage. Or... Like you can eat off of it. So. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have an answer for that question about how much I'm, it needs I'm, to be No, washed? I'm not certain. Um, um, but I would take the majority of the residue out of it. I think I think it very much depends on which depot it's going to, and I think that wow. then depends on where you live and where who's doing the waste. And I can because imagine the standards and the problems that, but I guess they're coming with. The gov, like the recycling being taken over away from municipalities, um, there will be more. I'm assuming standard recycling, um, but I I think also it could change if, for instance, you have a five or seven year contract with Miller Waste, and then at some point if. Uh, that contract comes up and then you put that bid out again, you could get a different recycling or garbage um, company who is now doing, um, dealing with your waste and recycling, and that could change everything on how, what can go in what bins. Um, so that's, I guess, a good reason to have easily accessible guidelines on what goes where. Um. I've got four people on the list right now. So the new is first, and then Logan, and then Lee, and then Taylor. Um, 
Does waste management include waste reduction at source? I'm going to say no. And I guess I, and Laura asked if there, it's too bad there's not a business component to the panel and things, so I guess I could turn my hat around. <laughs> and I can tell you it's very frustrating at my business that every piece of apparel and, and every sock, if it's manufactured offshore, comes in a plastic sheet film. Every, every unit. And it drives me nuts at my end, having to receive it. Um, I could tell you that at North America, we are just so much further ahead. Nike is a completely paperless company. Uh, I don't know if, if I sent them a check if they'd cash it. I don't think they would, actually. Um, it's, it's just what they've done. Um, Brooks is another company that um, leads by environmentally, they're a very strong company and their waste reduction strategies are very, very strong. This is a company that has uh, buzzers and alarms in their showers at their corporate, corporate offices in Seattle and it makes aware all the other employees if somebody's showering too long and using too much water. <laughs> um, they have, you know, they've got shoe midsoles that in an anaerobic state, breakdown within 20 years as compared to 1,000 year breakdown periods in the landfill. Um, so, and in manufacturing strategies, waste costs you money. So, these businesses are always incorporating new manufacturing methods to eliminate waste because it's a there's a financial plan and benefit to it. Uh, unfortunately, stuff that gets imported, I can see it. It's it's just there's so much more waste created if it's being imported from yeah in response to your question because i'm just reading my neighbor's notes <laughs> long-term waste management plan um when i moved to walkerton could it be 30 years ago from guelph my job was to work with the county of bruce and for five years wrote the long-term waste management plan with the assistance of consultants um, for Bruce County. There's two streams. There's reduce, reuse, recycle, and disposal. So no question, waste reduction in this hierarchy, in this order, reduction, reuse, recycle is part of a waste management plan. So it's not just about putting it in the landfill. Unfortunately, what's happened over the years is that recycling has taken the lead in the answer to our waste management issues. And the way things have gone with markets and whatnot, a lot of the recycling is uh, is not in, is not being recycled. It's ending up in landfills. So, you know, the answer to the single-use plastics, in my mind, is not to ban necessarily. I mean, banning it's fine, but especially for a coffee drink, you know, carry a mug, refill your bottle, and if you eliminate the the market for single-use plastics, that will go away. You know, so I think we have to, you know, just change, you know, lead by change on the ground. But. I was wondering if there's an opportunity for local businesses that want to take uh, some of the recyclables to make into other products, uh, for them to get some preferential access to the local recyclables or something like that, if there's any kind of programs either in effect or that might be viable, like Drop off bins or that are linked on the website, or what you guys think in, in, in that regard. Um, one, one easy example would be that there's a large amount of PET plastic, and uh, which can be transformed into 3D printer filaments, and uh, you could generate lots of different products. So, so, so yeah, well, what, <laughs> what options are there currently for local businesses to reuse the, the, uh, all of these plastics that we are buying and paying for in, within our own communities? That's a very broad question. I don't know who wants to answer that. <laughs> the, the problem is, um, if you're especially into a contract situation, 
Southgate, we are not into a contract with anyone in, in any regard that way, but I can see with the, the contract of services that those materials are owned by that, owned that business company or whatever. And if you're taking that away, you're taking dollars away from them. I, I agree that's a good good setup, good system, but it, there may be some challenges with if you're into a contract and that's their material. But to choose material that's not in the contract, like, like styrofoam or film plastic <laughs> or, I don't know, what else? <laughs> Okay. Lee, you're next. Uh, it was just a footnote to my I'm sorry, that's around the back to education to the public. There is a document that exists. Um, I'll just specifically put it on the CAT Facebook page as an image um, from Blue Water Recycling Association. It's Exeter, Huron County. And I, just, um, I guess the question is can something like that be produced? If the best catch this exists, can it be produced by one of the least instead of the town and thereby complementing an app? Or and you're just standing alone with no cost. Wouldn't would the town have that sort of leverage just to make that production, that publication happen? Hmm. So Blue Water is is an association of municipalities, as is Bruce Area Recycling. So they're one level different from the folks like Miller Waste that actually receive and in, the, in our case pick up the material. So they may have more freedom because they're owned by the municipalities. It, yeah. It, it's it, nobody, nobody, very few people, maybe, I don't know how many people will read it, read words on a page that's given to them on this paper with all the rest of the junk out, but um, it, anyway, I'll just see if you see, I don't know how to get it to you guys, I'll send it to you all. Um, I would like to see what the other ways produce that or the town produce that. here had to post it on our fridge because we had four or five different things that we had to do and we were from Toronto where David Miller said they're not going to recycle unless you just throw everything in the same box. So in Toronto they threw everything into the blue bin right? other than compost obviously. And then we came up here and it was like well you need to put this in a bag, you need to put this in a cardboard box and this one needs to go into the blue bin. So we had that on our fridge for a good year, and then actually created labels, because I kind of a label freak, about this goes into this area. And even so, like you, I have to occasionally go to those labels and try to figure out what it is. So I think, you know, picture is worth a thousand words. Um, that's why I think some of these apps work really, really well. That, you know, I just looked at the Meaford one right now, you know, you, you search coffee and it comes up with a whole bunch of different things and then it shows you a picture. Yeah, it's a good I, I, yeah. I questioned the first picture I saw, <laughs> that whether it was accurate or not, but that's okay. Um, it shows you a lid of a coffee mug and then it tells you this is where it goes and so it's helpful for people. But also in my experience, not everybody will go to an app. You know, not everybody is comfortable with that and it doesn't really even matter the age. So I think there needs to be a so we have several other, layers yeah. of communication, right? Yeah, we yeah. have paper and electronic copies yeah. of that similar, like, here's some photos of different things, or like, it's not as expansive as the app, but the app provides a little bit more interactive and the ability to have more information if it is something. Exactly, for the people that really want that. But the other people that don't want it, if we could at least communicate 90% of the information on something like you're describing. It removes the confusion about the PET versus the five versus the three. Yeah. People don't have time for that. Yeah. I understand that the app also um, sends messages. Like people get a message that says your because it's Eastern or yeah. whatever it's very your cool. your day has been delayed to Tuesday or something. Yeah. So for instance, um, last weekend was our last leaf and yard drop off day, and because of the weather, we've extended it to this weekend as well. And so as soon as we put that into the app on our end, people received messages on their phone that said, like it popped up and said, you know, 
leaf and yard waste has been extended to this date at this time. Um, you can choose not to get those notifications, but if you want to, it's part of, of the app. Good. I was asking, uh, I think probably, Tori, about uh, where is your green bin waste goes to? Was done with that? So, um, currently it goes to a facility. I could be wrong with the location. I've only been with the municipality for two months, so. Um, but I think it currently goes to a location in Hanover, possibly. It's it's at a location in Ontario, and there is a location um, closer by that will or is in the process of coming on board within the next. I think it's like five years. Um, and so currently, y our compost needs to go into compostable bags, um, but at the new facility, we'll be able to accept any bags, um, which just makes it a little bit easier to compost, because what they can do, um, different facilities can remove those bags, and some of them can't. So um, it just creates easier access for people who find purchasing compostable bags as a barrier, um, so hopefully it will help increase our use of compost. Thank you. Well, well I, have a, I have a question for those from the, from the municipalities, well, for anybody, I guess. And I've noticed that I, I know a number of people that really resist buying bag tags. Is that, is that an issue for you? Uh, I mean, where I work, we find people, there's a dumpster out back, and they come and throw their garbage in a company dumpster. Um, <laughs> because they're, they, they resist buying a bag tag. Is that, do you feel that's an issue at all? For us, we have a cart system. So if they want an additional waste cart, it costs them to purchase the cart, which is about $80. And then there's a $100 tipping fee, and they, it, that's the annual for that. Um, and if they want a second or third one, that's a, another hundred dollar tipping fee because it's going to landfill. As far as organics or blue carts, you can purchase those and have them as extras. There's no fees for collecting extra green or blue carts, but waste we charge. So that's our bag tag type, yeah. type thing, but that's what we have. So is No, unless they take it to the transfer station, they take a pickup load or something, then they're going to be charged for the pickup load of garbage. But no, for curbside collection, um, that's mm -hmm. part of the program, unless you have additional cart. But, sorry, am I understanding that everybody pays the same amount for garbage pickup? Well, it, it's through their tax, their tax, but taxes the amount, are paid. the amount each household pays for garbage pickup is the same? Unless they use more than one. Yeah. 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 No, I understand. There is no. I understand now, but just um, wondering where the incentive to reduce the amount of garbage you put out comes in that system. Because in bag tags, if I, I've lived here since July, I just finished my first set of five bag tags. <laughs> and, you know, my, my goal is to make the next set of five bag tags last. You know, for six months, it's winter, garbage not spent. Um, you know, it's an incentive to reduce it. It's not all money, but it's just the fact that you have to pay, you have to go to the store and buy them. So there, that, for me, is enough incentive to try, um, among all the other reasons, but to try and reduce the amount of garbage I put out. So for us, you're paying an extra $100. You're paying $100 for the year. And we're going to pick your card up if you have the extra one with your regular one, 26 times a year. There won't be 50 times a year. It's 26 mm -hmm. because it, we're only bi-weekly. So. Yeah, no, I what you're Tori or Scott, do you feel there's any resistance to buying bag tags to pay? I can tell you there is <laughs> uh, because uh, I actually worked with Laura one day. About a month ago, it was a lovely sunny day, and we went through four bags of garbage that had been left at the mill dam, uh, discreetly just put off into the bush. Uh, it's very frustrating. The cost of the municipality is 
I believe it's been a little while since I saw this number, but I think it's well north of ten thousand uh, dollars in the additional costs that are born picking up uh, garbage uh, just left downtown. Primarily, it's it's super frustrating. I. I'll see piles of it where there's 8, 10, 12 bags left at a time and not only is it not on garbage day, it might be one day before or one day after garbage day and that still means then that Public Works has to make a special trip mm -hmm. and it uses up further resources in gathering it. So other things have been tried but um, it's an ongoing problem. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I think garbage being left where it's not supposed to be is an issue in any municipality regardless of bag tags because most locations have a limit at least to how much garbage you can put out. Mm -hmm. um, so I think if there's any type of limit, whether it's a cost or just a limit on bags, there's going to be some people who don't follow it. But I think there clearly is some incentive by having maybe the cost of bag tags or that bag limit that is um, lower than some people are used to doing, then people try to make the effort to actually meet it instead of buying additional bag tags. Um, so I think it just creates incentives for the people who maybe would want to, but just need that slight incentive to actually go forward with producing less garbage. One, one of the guys I work with he was working on a Saturday morning and he happened to be behind the building where the dumpster is and a pickup truck pulled in all full of garbage backed up to the dumpster, and he sat there and watched them. And they looked at him for a minute, and then they drove away. <laughs> <laughs> he thought, well, I'm probably going to come back after hours when nobody's here. Yeah. Yeah, I, there's, there's going to be a percentage of the population that really doesn't want to participate. <laughs> and, um, and this has been going on for a while. And the most effective response to that dumping garbage without tags because people don't want to have to pay for it and they don't mind being gross about what they do with it. Um, is that it's, it's actually very difficult to collect household garbage for even a week and not have something in that bag that identifies the address from which it emits. And as, as the first time I got involved in this environmental group, was when I was in university. Trust me, that's a long time ago. Uh, late 60s. And uh, over out of the Queen, so North Kingston. And people were dumping garbage bags in ditches all over the rural area outside of Kingston. And so we had a whole team of, uh, of students who went out and found these things, went through them, identified the address, took photographs of the bag, Put a stake with a ribbon on it, a half a K that way and a half a K that way down, down, the, uh, down the road, and then uh, delivered the picture and uh, a little letter to the offender and uh, said, this, this is your stuff. And so now this is your responsibility to clean this kilometer of ditch, including the bag that you dropped at the point, um, or by this date or we will publicly shame you and publish this. And uh, it worked really well. Um, but it's, it's a, you know, and, and we never got visited by any lawyer's letters or the police or anybody else for having done that. And, you know, I'm so old, that's, that's even before the internet. So we've got a lot more tools to deal with that at this point. Um, but it's doable. Uh, but it's, it's, a, it's an impact on a relatively small percentage of the total population. And they, uh, the bigger job is to do the things that obviously need to be done, like education and awareness and accessible information, for all the people who really want to do it. That's, that's the folks we should probably be focusing on. Mm -hmm. The rest are going to be really, really expensive and hard to deal with. But they always are. I think that's a really good point, and uh, the one thing that I find a little frustrating is to hear, even tonight, over and over again, you know, 20 years ago we talked about this, 30 years ago we talked about this. So I think that in, in this group, it, it's a group of individuals who have been concerned about the issue for years. 
What our group focuses on is what each individual does. So each one of us in this room probably represents how many garbage bags that are going out on a yearly basis. And how can we individually change our behavior, share it with friends, share it with family, so that they start. Um, last year, uh, I said to Jack, if we have plastic, we can't use it once. So just that change in our life meant it was never, we were never purchasing another plastic bag. Actually, we name our plastic bags in our house. They become part of the family, and we're sad when they break a leg, because then what do we do with them? Just a simple change that we can make. A couple things that we've noticed. First of all, our garbage hasn't been out for we've missed two. We're going to be we'll we'll be six weeks. We'll have we'll have one bag in six weeks, um, and and we. Yeah, and, and we've, we've changed what we recycle. We've looked in and we said, we're not buying that plastic stuff anymore. Each person in this room can actually make that change. Or, and I think this is a great discussion. I really do, and I don't want anybody to, please don't take offense at what I'm saying, but we could spend our time talking about those people who litter, who aren't us, or those people that do this, or what's the city going to do, or how come we don't have composting, right? All of those things are really good points, but each one of us are consumers who generate waste. So we have to look at what we're doing as well. And I think if all three were working together, it'd be fabulous. Because I'm pretty sure if we're just relying on one, we've got a dysfunctional situation. Because for 30 years we've been talking about this. And from our trash pickups, we've just found more ingenious ways to wrap things in plastic. You know, stuff that I see that our kids 30 years ago weren't doing single-use yogurt containers. I mean, it's just amazing what what is out there right now that wasn't even out when you were at university and talking about this, okay? So I think it's a great discussion, but I think, you know, we do kind of have to turn the focus in on ourselves individually and say, what are we doing? Now, the one caveat I would say to that is, None of us is perfect. You know, we all have different priorities. I got a pair of leather gloves in there, you know? Um, Jack and I eat meat. Other people don't eat meat. They have different priorities. But from a waste and sustainability point of view, you have to look at our life and say, how can we actually use, how can we generate less? Um, and that's why I really asked to be part of this panel because we could have envy over Meaford's film and we could say gee we wish you ha we had your composting but there are things that we can do individually ourselves in Owen Sound today even if the city of Owen Sound doesn't do it so that's what I would encourage people to look for if you have any questions or ideas our group is really happy um, to investigate all sorts of different things try different activities um, share learning that we have found. Uh, the other thing I will share in addition to the fact that our output has gone down is our food bill has gone down dramatically. Um, and it's probably gone down about 20% this year. And I guess we were stockpiling food. I guess we were throwing out more stuff that we didn't realize we were doing. One example is we don't buy uh, vegetables or uh, anything wrapped in plastic. So if you go into the store and they have carrots wrapped in plastic and the carrots that are not, we will only buy the ones that are not. And often that means more shopping and we can't get the thing we're looking for because they only have a wrap in plastic, so we stole them with that. Yeah, so we could get naked food, but we might only buy three carrots, you know, as opposed to a bunch that might, two of them might go bad at the end of it. Just walk through with any supermarket, what the right is terrifying. Mm -hmm. plastic, mm -hmm. terrifying. So, so... It is, in, it is encouraging. You can actually make substantial change in your own household. It took us about a year and a half to actually fully start seeing the results of it, but each one of us um, can do it. One of the first things Rochelle said was do an audit. Who, who did the audit? Was that you, Barry? The, the idea of an audit. Um, she, she said look at, your, uh, look at your recycling container. What's in there? You know, for us, we know it's soda pop cans. 
And I, the only reason that soda pop cans in there, it's, that's the item that you guys make money off of in the recycling stream. There's not a lot of plastic anymore, not plastic containers. There's ways you can get around that sort of thing. Um, but do an audit of your own stuff and see how much food you're throwing out, um, how much recycling you have, how much food you're buying in plastic. And, and the, change anyway, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so I just encourage it. I find it actually quite encouraging. Um, I do kind of find discuss, discussions about, we talked about this 30 years ago, kind of depressing. I was doing something else. I wasn't talking about it 30 years ago, so kudos. Um, but I think that there's something that each one of us in this room can do. Personally. I think you can enlarge, you know, people thinking about when I go to the liquor store, I just say, no, I'll take the bottle. Thanks for not asking if I want a bag. Or, you know, yeah. the people who are handing out bags all the time or, or in the grocery store, no, I've got my bags here. And really emphasize the point with people who, who are handing out plastic bags until such time as we don't are, are allowed yeah, I agree, I agree. You know, we, we always try to, in our group, we always try to be friendly with people. Yeah. Uh, sometimes we have to be friendly and firm, but, you know, <laughs> just friendly. Just a couple days ago was a friendly and firm, but, it, you know, normally it's, it's very friendly. One of the latest things is not accepting receipts. Um, uh, a lot of the receipts are not recyclable if they're the kind that you can scratch with a coin and they are dark on it. And in fact, they have a lot of chemicals on those receipts. I feel very badly for the people working in the stores actually dealing with these chemicals. But a way around that is you can get an app on your phone from your bank. And you can set up notifications and they will send you notifications of what you've spent. So we don't need to keep the receipts. So I often, as you suggest, will say, can you stop the receipt for me because I don't need it? Yeah, you're educating everybody you speak to. And I think in Owen Sound, probably about 80% of the stores I talk to say, well, no, we can't, and that per clerk then crumples that up and sticks it in the garbage. Um, but, you know, just focusing on the waste aspect, that is one way you, know, you can do it yourself. Other banks, we're at Scotiabank, when you deposit a check, there's no envelopes now. Mm -hmm. You know, so things can change. Um, that's encouraging. Um, unfortunately, I, I'm, I'm, although I helped with Laura, um, I think the turnout here um, shows that the percentage of people who want to do it is much smaller than the people who actually will do it without incentive or without ease. And that is the beauty of the recycling program, is it's just so easy to put things into those things. Yep. And it's working. So I think what we have to do is, is it really has to be a bigger thing than just individuals. It has to be the city, it has to be the municipality, it has to be the province, it has to be the businesses. Because if we don't keep it relatively easy and make it easier maybe because it's not even there to do. We're going to be just, we're not going to be buried in the stuff, we're just going to die because, you know, there's so much plastic in our systems that we'll start going more. <laughs> um, it, it's got to, we have to be, we have to be bigger, we have to be, we, it has to go further than just the individuals. The individuals have to be the ones who work at making other people listen, which is why we're here. Mm -hmm. Okay, do you have one that wants to be the last question and then we're going to listen to this? I have a comment. I mean, I really appreciate events like this because we need to have the narratives around garbage and waste, which we usually don't have. So the stories of garbage are a reflection of our society, basically. And so we talk about change, we only can change once we think about it. So we need a lot more of those kind of events, because most people actually don't think about it. It's part of our collective narrative that we don't think about garbage. We put it somewhere and it's, it's gone, like so many other things. Um, so, I, I mean, they're both sides, right? That's what you talk, we, we, we need 
a bigger picture approach, but you also need an individual responsibility. And it is all has to do with responsibility on the consumer side. All of this just like what, um, what what Brian said, you know, people throwing garbage away. Well, I must say it is less these days than when I came to Canada 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. I'm a cyclist, so I see the garbage on the side of the roads. The other thing is, um, there, there are lots of examples, public in Europe and not in California, mm -hmm. where they have uh, very, very progressive ways of dealing with um, material, or what do we call it, like not just not just waste, because we shouldn't talk about waste, we should talk about the stuff that we use, the materials, and some of this goes into waste. So in Denmark, for example, so, uh, uh, Germany, have a lot less waste because they just uh, use much more materials that are reusable. So I was wondering if it's possible to, to, to study those, those uh, cultures, basically, that, that, that have a, a much longer tradition in in these issues around waste and not waste, um, uh, rather than always reinventing the wheel, that's what I find sometimes really, really uh, frustrating. You know, we can sit here and discuss and, and how to figure this out, how to how to build this wheel, while well, the wheel is already invented somewhere else. So mm -hmm. this is a suggestion to, to to go out of our world here and look what's up out there and maybe come up with more collective ways of, of, of dealing with these bigger issues. And it's true, it came out a few times. Like, it's different in Mifo, it's different in Amazon, it's different in Hong Kong. It's completely confusing. And, and uh, so maybe there are more things that we can do, kind of put it together in, in collective uh, approaches. But thanks again for putting this in. Thank you. My, my, my father in law sent me this. That, uh, we, we always talk about the three R's. Well, there are much more R's here. First one rethink your choices, yeah. refuse single use. Reduce consumption. Reuse everything. Refurbish old stuff. Repair before you replace. Repurpose, be creative, inventive. Recycle as the last option. Mm -hmm. Those are food for thought there. Give the panel another thank you. They've taken time out of their lives to come and share information with us, which is very valuable and timely. And as Joachim just said, we need to keep this conversation going. And, and as Laura really pointed out, it's it's a lot of individual choices that we make. And, and we can make a big difference. And we can push the upper level of government if we do that. And, and I, I had a thought, you know, Tim Hortons, so I find all these Tim Hortons cups on the side of the road. Well, Tim Hortons should sell coffee in a, in a, re, a single use cup for three bucks, and if you bring your own cup, sell it for a dollar. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, people just, would bring their own cups. Yeah, they give a very, very small discount if you bring your re, yeah. refillable cup, and discount. it's hard to actually find yeah. them for yeah. sale there. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. So, thank you for coming, and. Uh, Anyway, uh, you can leave now or stay if you want. We have a <laughs>
just to get their input on this. So um, we're hoping that's going to go forward soon. Um, we're also working on developing relationships with uh, Saudi and Ojibwe Nation folks and bring them into our conversation and, and, and figure out ways to work together. Um, a number of us attended the Regional Environmental Seminar in Walkerton, so there's a lot of groups in the area and we're trying to work on a way to share information among us. Uh, we had a little meeting tonight about trying to bring that forward. Um, also, if you're an Owen Sounder, there's um, December 6th is the deadline for submitting uh, to volunteer on a committee. There's vacancies in all the different committees, and it's a really good way that we can have an impact on um, what's happening in the city in terms of climate change. Um, and the other thing that we're doing is we're educating ourselves about the Trans-Canada Energy Hydro Pump Storage Project in Mipru. And that, oh, I learned today at the um, Ball Lecture that um, it's going to be a very long process in terms of environmental assessment, but I think it's something we all need to know about. Um, it could be... A, in the first you know, meeting, the public meeting for that TCE is happening on December the 11th. Here? In Meeper, the community oh, okay, center. Thank you. It's an open house from 5.30 to 9. The company, uh, TransCanada uh, Energy, who is going to be building this $3.3 billion facility. Proposing, right? It's not a done deal. No, no, it's not a done deal. The proponents. But given their uh, connections with provincial parties, uh, it's going to be a hard sell for individual groups. But anyways, this company is coming to give their proposal as an open house. So there is a group called Save, you know, Save, Save George and Bay. George and Bay that is asking everyone and anyone who wants to know about what is involved in this to come during that to learn. And there's supposed to be one in Owen Sound later as well? Yeah, in the winter. Yes. Yeah, okay. And I just wanted to say, if you're not on the CAT the mailing list, uh, you can sign up over there or take a photo of our info. So you can sign up to get the newsletter online yourself. And while you're doing that, uh, Oh. We ask you to put in two dollars as a, uh, a fee. We don't pay rent for this room, but there's upkeep on this building, and the Harmony Center asks us to have people put in two bucks anytime they come. Okay, thanks. Um, can I just say that? Uh, um, can I request of the communications committee that they send media releases about events like this because we didn't get anything, mm -hmm. so you know mm -hmm. it's hard to get the word out, and it's a free... Are you, are, are you on our... Um... But I get things like posters and stuff, and that's no use to me. Okay. If I put that on Facebook, Facebook thinks it's an ad that I, as a company, am not paying Mark Zuckerberg for. So they don't, it doesn't go anywhere. So I need an actual media release. Just some text. Quick, short text. With an okay. image that okay. has no text on it. Okay. Okay? Thank you. And I'm sure everybody else in the media feels the same way. Not, not just me, but... Okay. Well, thanks for that tip, Anne. We'll, we'll work on that for sure. Okay. Well, okay. Vice School Committee. Uh, so I just wanted to make a quick announcement that we successfully managed to complete the bicycle friendly community application and uh, submitted it. And we also had an update so, so to the uh, sharetheroad.ca. Um, so they, they're the one that, that uh, gave the bicycle friendly community awards to uh, St. Toronto and other, other municipalities. Uh, so we completed it for Owen Sound, and we also uh, had s several people fill in the uh, reviews. Um, I, I believe it was four, and we we, uh, we needed a minimum of two. So we, we've successfully um, it's it's been accepted, and uh, it's currently undergoing review. And we should find out in early December uh, whether or not uh, Owen Sound got the award. And so I'll, I'll be able to announce that at our next uh, December meeting. Okay. Everyone for your support. Depot <laughs> <laughs> for renewable energy. Where's Barry? He was kind of, uh, the reason I was going kind to of get Barry to talk about it because it, uh, we did a tour of my house uh, on November the second, 
Uh, we joined uh, anyone from here, from the Climate Action Group here, and also the one in Great Highlands. Uh, I was anticipating about 10 or 12 people um, <laughs> for, for one tour, and we ended up having over 35 people over two tours, and had to send back another 20 or 30 people because uh, I only have so much room in my house. Um, but the interest was substantial that people, and out of these people that came for the tour, uh, we decided that uh, to have workshops in the spring. I already have lined up almost a dozen people who live either off the grid or partially off the grid that will donate part of their time so people can see because every one of these homes is distinct and a hybrid in itself and people had to do an awful lot. They just, who live there, they didn't just come up with a plan and said, well, I'll just make what's already been done. So uh, it was quite, um, uh, David was there and many from here as well, yeah. but uh, like I said, there were actually three other homeowners, uh, families who were also off the grid, but they wanted to learn uh, different things. So uh, I, I think that uh, this is the starting point. Uh, we are sending a letter to everyone who attended the opportunity to get together so we can have a continuous learning curve on not just the off-the-grid, but on sustainable living, um, using some of this reuse, <laughs> reduce, uh, because we're reducing how much energy we're using. So um, that was a, a good start for us. I just want to mention that uh, for anyone that has it or, or, or wants to review uh, what happened there, there are videos available at the, and you can get the links from the Climate Action Team Facebook group. You just scroll down and see VTOL, 7th Generation, and all of their three parts. And, and I'll just report from the Waste Management Committee. Uh, well, tonight was one of our events, and uh, we were going to have a backyard composter on the panel, but she couldn't make it tonight. And uh, so we're going to plan a, a, a spring workshop, a hands-on workshop in the spring for backyard composting, because I think that can be a good complement to, you know, the city, the city that never does green pickup, at least, you know, we'll be teaching people how to do it properly in the backyard. And uh, I mean, there's, there are only some, not everybody can do it in the backyard. The people in apartments probably aren't going to do composting unless the whole complex does. It. I mean, you can have, you can get your neighbors together and have one site in, on, on a street maybe. I mean, anything's possible, I think. So, and that can definitely help with what has to go into the landfill. So, in the spring, when the war weather warms up, we'll, we'll, we'll have a workshop. Uh, on a Saturday or something like that, hopefully. So that's basically it from waste management. Uh, youth group. Is there anybody here to represent the youth group? I was talking about with Marilyn. Um, I can speak to what they're Okay. Yeah. Um, so the youth group has a petition uh, to, for Owen Sound to declare a climate crisis, which they started gathering signatures in March and they have over 600. And they are meeting with the mayor next week and planning to bring it to city council December 2nd. And we would, you know, please come if you can. I'll send out a notice about that. Um, the strategy is not to ask the city to declare a crisis because we just don't have enough votes for that at this point. But we we're going to, the youth are going to ask them, they're going to actually be speaking at this deputation. The, about three of them, I think, which takes great courage, probably a nine-year-old, a 12-year-old, and a 15-year-old, something like that, uh, along with Sonia Ostertag. And um, they're going to ask the city to consider that during the 